Hello from the Channel Studio in London and welcome to another edition of Foreign Dispatches. I'm Teniola Uyitayo. On the programme this week, a lack of food, clean water and shelter takes a toll on hundreds of thousands of people in Gaza, plus Russia's invasion of Ukraine near its two-year mark as Ukrainian president struggles to secure more aid. Displaced Gazans are enduring a harsh winter without proper shelter after over three months of war. Nearly all of Gaza's 2.3 million people have lost their homes, forced out by Israel's bombardment and ground offensive. Families and strangers crowd together in makeshift tents. They are bravely enduring harsh winter conditions amidst Israel's ground assault. Winters in Gaza typically last from December to March, with average to low temperatures dropping to 8 degrees Celsius in January. For those already struggling to stay safe, warm and fed, illness poses an additional risk. The shortage of medical supplies and sanitation worsens the vulnerability of the population, leaving them at heightened risk of winter-related illnesses. Pharmacists are running out of everything inside. Therefore, we are trying to provide life-saving assistance with the minimum standard. We're seeing a uh, humanitarian catastrophe unfold before our eyes here across the Gaza Strip. It's not just that there's 85% of the population that has been displaced. Many of them have been displaced multiple times. Uh, here in Rafa, where I am, there's shelters, spontaneous shelters everywhere. Uh, people are sleeping under tarpaulins, under makeshift tents. Um, in very crowded shelters. Their families are risking their lives to just seek care. And so these, these numbers that um, Rick presented, the 22,000 plus who have been killed, the 58,000 who were injured, many of them uh, are treatable if, they're, if they have access to care. They have injuries that are treatable. They have limbs that unfortunately are being amputated because they don't have access to surgery over the last few weeks. The emergency departments are still seeing a steady stream of trauma, a steady stream of trauma among children who are playing in the street, among uh, people who are in their homes. Um, so from our side, it's difficult to see that. Um, we're, we are still seeing, and I can say this with certainty, is uh, a huge number of casualties and a huge number of casualties related to um, uh, hostilities. So shrapnel injuries, gunshot wounds, crush injuries from buildings that have collapsed. That's still happening every single day. Hunger is also ravaging Gaza, and this is expected to increase illness across the Strip. This war brought up an unbearable level of humiliation. Too much struggle and humiliation, so we can only be able to provide lunch. Life here has become so expensive, it's unbearable. We do not eat, drink or sleep properly and nothing is available. It takes me 45 minutes by foot to get the meal and another 45 minutes to come back so I can provide it to them. I don't know what to say anymore. The situation is extremely difficult. According to the United Nations, 93% of the population in Gaza is facing crisis levels of hunger with insufficient food and high levels of malnutrition. What is happening in Gaza is unprecedented, both in terms of its scale, but also how quickly it is happening. You know, in the world right now, there are about 130,000 people who are in catastrophic levels of hunger, meaning they are starving. In Gaza, more than half a million. That is four times more. And that is what makes this totally unprecedented. WFP has been working with partners and communities to deliver food as quickly as possible and as many people as possible, and also supporting local shops, bakeries to operate. So far, we've reached around 1.4 million people with food, but everyone in Gaza is hungry. We're exploring all possible solutions, but none are sufficient in the face of obstacles. There are people starving in areas and we are not able to give basic food for. The needs are rising faster than we are able to respond. We need to be able to bring in more supplies and we need safe access to reach people everywhere in Gaza, not just those who are close to the borders. We need a long lasting ceasefire to stop the suffering. 
IDPs have reported an average access of less than two litres of water per person per day, well below the recommended requirement for survival. We don't have any kind of medicine available not for the children and not for the elderly people. Also, unfortunately, the water is polluted, which has led to many diseases. Doctors and aid workers have been warning of the spread of disease and epidemics since the start of the war. Very important, an evacuation of medical staff from the main hospital due to their fears of safety. They and their family leave. leave. It's a recipe of further disaster and, and makes the hospital um, more non-functional. So they become from functional, partly functional, barely functional. And this, we witnessed this in the north and we want to appeal again also to the international community. The situation is indescribable. Almost 90% of the population of Gaza, 1.9 million people, have been displaced and many have been forced to move multiple times. People are standing in line for hours for a small amount of water, which may not be clean, or bread, which alone is not sufficiently nutritious. Only 15 hospitals are functioning, even partially. The lack of clean water and sanitation and overcrowded living conditions are creating the ideal environment for diseases to spread. Delivering humanitarian aid in Gaza continues to face nearly <coughs> insurmountable challenges. Intense bombardment, restrictions on movement, fuel shortages, and interrupted communications make it impossible for WHO and our partners to reach those in need. We have the supplies the teams and the plans in place. What we don't have is access. With limited hospitals in operation, women are forced to give birth in tents in unsterile conditions. I was terrified for the one million women and girls in Gaza. 690,000 women and girls of menstruating age, 5,500 pregnant women due to give birth in this coming month. That's 180 births every single day in Gaza right now. Many of them suffering from thirst, malnutrition, lack of health. If the bombs don't kill them, if disease, hunger and dehydration don't catch up with them, simply giving life will. And we can't let this happen. Those who were breastfeeding who are no longer able to because their milk sources have dried up for, for many reasons, including uh, hydration, nutrition and other issues. And of course, that then leads on to nutrition challenges for the newborns as well. Smoke from the wood fires is also exacerbating respiratory ailments. A shortage of antibiotics is driving deaths from post-operative infections among the wounded. And the chronically ill, unable to access care and medication, are said to be dying often unrecorded as victims of the war. Meanwhile, with a health system on its knees, many in Gaza, especially children, are not receiving the medical attention and supplies they need. Aid agencies report that the war is claiming the lives of more than 100 children each day, and many more will suffer from lifelong disabilities and health issues. The pediatric ward in a hospital in Han Yunus, southern Gaza, has seen a sharp rise in young patients. Many have infections such as gastroenteritis. My daughter got sick on the first day of the war when we were staying safely in our houses. The Israeli army bombed the nearby houses. The scattered glass and thick smoke filled our house. This made all my five children suffer from breathing difficulties. But her condition is the most difficult. Every morning, I take her to the hospital, but as you can see, the facility is overcrowded with patients and there isn't enough medication. The number of cases has increased to four times its normal levels. Most of the water being consumed by children is unfit for human consumption. Most of the food is canned. People have lost access to fresh food. There's no fruit, 
no vegetables. Children have had a deficiency in vitamins, immune deficiency, in addition to iron deficiencies and anemia from the lack of nutrition. There's also a severe lack of medicine in Gaza to treat children. Here, patients are seen waiting to receive medical attention in crowded corridors. Basically, the whole hospital was filled with displaced persons, thousands of them, reportedly tens of thousands of them, living in the operating theaters, living in the corridors, living in the stairs. And the emergency department, seeing hundreds of patients a day, mostly trauma, with only a handful, literally five or six doctors or nurses, uh, to care for all of those people. Patients on the floor, so many that you could barely move without stepping on somebody's hands or, or feet. Um, in Al-Ahli Hospital, also in the north, I saw patients who were lying on church pews, basically waiting to die in a hospital that had no fuel, no power, no water, uh, very, very little in the way of medical supplies, uh, and only a handful of staff remaining to take care of them. The UN Humanitarian Office has warned that Gaza faces a public health disaster due to the collapse of its health system and the spread of disease as Israel wages an offensive that has hit hospitals and displaced most of Gaza's population. We are dealing of infectious diseases, gastroenteritis, hepatitis, skin disorders, uh, respiratory disorders because of overcrowding, because of lack of healthy food, lack of healthy water, lack of healthy environment, no electricity, no fuels, no light, no hope, no security, no sterilization, no stability because of this Israeli war, because of Israeli closure of the Gaza Strip. No medications and no drugs, no medical stuff. Children are admitted with extreme dehydration to the point of kidney failure and doctors say they are seeing an increase in breathing problems as families resort to burning wood and garbage to cook. As you can see, our kids are suffering from stomach flu, coughing, suffocation. There's no diesel. Everyone is filling their car tanks with used cooking oil, and it's not healthy at all and causes diseases. Mahmoud Abdul is taking shelter in the makeshift tent with his three children who are all under three years old. He says conditions at this camp for the displaced in Khan Yunis are making his children ill and there's little treatment available. The elders caught gastroenteritis, then the second, then the third. Day after day I go to the hospital seeking treatment, but they haven't got the treatment the children need. They give us some medicine to drink, but it's not enough to cure them. The World Health Organization has also reported a sharp rise in acute respiratory infections, diarrhea, lice, scabies, and other fast-spreading conditions. Um, most of the shelters are not equipped with the um, toilets or the showers or the clean water that people need in these shelters simply because the numbers of people that came to these shelters is just overwhelming and also because many of these shelters that we've opened to receive people who were forced to flee their homes uh, were not meant to be shelters. According to the Gaza Health Ministry run by Hamas, thousands of children have already died from the violence as living conditions continue to rapidly deteriorate the risk of mounting child deaths. Gaza Health authorities say over 23,000 people have been confirmed killed in Israeli strikes, with thousands more missing and presumed dead under the rubble. As the conflict passed the 100 days mark on Sunday, thousands around the world took to the streets to condemn the violence. I don't, I don't think you can be human and like know what's going on in Gaza and not be um, absolutely like um, it, for it not to break your heart. Um, I just think that all of the things I've heard about um, them bombing hospitals, all of the innocent babies, I, that's something I can't stand behind and I don't want to look back on this day and say I didn't use my voice and show up. Israel launches war against Hamas in Gaza after the Palestinian group sends its fighters 
on a terrorist rampage in Israel that killed 1,200 people. When Foreign Dispatches returns in just a moment, children on the front line in Ukraine yearn to return back to school. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us on the program. As Russia's invasion of Ukraine approaches the two-year mark, the conflict appears to have hit a stalemate. Despite some advances, a major counteroffensive mounted by Kyiv seven months ago has not made substantial progress. Ukraine has also warned that it's been forced to downsize some military operations due to a drop-off in foreign aid. Near the Ukrainian city of Kopyansk, white concrete barricades and coals of razor wire stretch for more than a mile. Trenches with basic living quarters are being dug here under cover of darkness. Artillery rumbles can be heard nearby. These are the country's new northeastern defensive lines after it stepped up construction of its fortification in recent months. It's part of a shift in military operations against Russia to a more defensive footing. The goal? to help Ukraine weather assaults while regenerating its forces as Moscow takes the battlefield initiative, according to military analysis. As soon as the troops are moving, traversing fields, you can do without fortifications. But when the troops stop, you need to immediately dig in. This guarantees us safety. The lines bear some similarities to those rolled out in the Russian-occupied south and east. The Ukrainian army engineer says the country is trying to minimize the use of mines for its fortifications to avoid leaving dangerous munitions on its territory. President Vladimir Zelensky announced that Ukraine was significantly enhancing its fortifications late November. That's after a slow progressing counteroffensive at launch in June. The main task for us engineers is to ensure the mobility of our troops and to make it as difficult as possible for the enemy's troops to move. We do all types of barriers, whether mined or without mines. Our job is all about fortified areas. Kiev says its ambition is to recapture all occupied territory. But its current focus is politically sensitive. Conscription reform to help replenish its manpower and artillery shortages at the front. Analysts say that Russia has been wrapping up offensive pressure around eastern towns and that it no longer needs to hold back its reserve troops for fear of a possible Ukrainian breakthrough. Hundreds of thousands of troops have been killed on both sides. According to the United Nations, more than 10,200 civilians have also been killed in Ukraine since February 2022. The new year has brought no respite to Ukraine. On the contrary, in recent weeks, the country has been suffering some of the worst attacks since the beginning of the illegal war. Over the holiday period, Russian missiles and drones targeted numerous locations across the country. Since 20 February 2022, more than 10,200, including 575 children, have been killed, and those injured, over 19,300. Among them are nearly a dozen civilians killed in a series of strikes on Pokrovsk district in Donetsk region, among them five children. Across the country, attacks and extreme weather have left millions of people in a record 1,000 villages and towns without electricity or water. Since the beginning of this week, as temperatures dropped to below minus 15 degrees Celsius. Amid this turmoil, the people of Ukraine have continued to demonstrate extraordinary resilience. The emergency services, volunteers and family members work tirelessly to free from people from under the rubble of damaged buildings or to recover the bodies of those killed so they can receive the dignity of a funeral and proper interment. 14.6 million people, 40% of the population in Ukraine will need humanitarian aid. 4 million people are internally displaced. That's in addition to those who are externally displaced. It's been as bad as it could be this last month, hasn't it? And that's really been quite shocking. The, the, the number of attacks, the broad range across the whole of the country um, from Russia has been absolutely unrelenting. 3.3 million people living in the middle of war zones of daily bombardment of 
uncertainty about where the day will end. And that's really a shockingly high number, even these days. Donetsk and Kharkiv regions, families live in damaged houses with no pipe water, gas, or electricity in the freezing cold. Constant bombardments force older people to spend their days in basements. Children, terrified, traumatized, still have lived for the last three years under these circumstances, trapped indoors, and many, 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 many of them with no schooling. The total displacement today, I'll focus on that, is about 10 million people. If you add the <coughs> almost 4 million estimated to be displaced inside Ukraine and the over 6 million dis, um, estimated to be refugees worldwide, of the people outside, especially those in Europe that are just over <coughs> 5 million, so the bulk, uh, some people do go back and forth. Um, but uh, um, uh, the return has not been in very huge numbers. In some positive developments, in a surprise visit to Kiev, the British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak reaffirmed the UK's support to Ukraine by signing a security pact that increases funding to buy drones and other military equipment. This will include more air defence equipment, more anti-tank weapons, more long-range missiles, thousands of rounds more ammunition and artillery shells, training for thousands more Ukrainian servicemen and women, and £200 million to build thousands more drones, the single largest package of drones given to Ukraine by any nation. The latest commitment takes the UK's overall support for Ukraine's war efforts to almost £12 billion. The UK is also the first country to sign a final security agreement with Ukraine after G7 countries agreed to last year's NATO summit to sign bilateral security assurances with the country. The military support comes at a crucial time for President Zelensky amidst fears that interest is flagging amongst allies as the war drags on. Meanwhile, many schools in the frontline regions of Ukraine have been forced to teach online throughout the war, following disruptions caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and now the nearly two-year Russian invasion, Ukrainian students are eager to return to normality. Sitting alone in our bedroom, shelter, Ukrainian third grader Arina Harasimova schooling is punctuated with warnings of what to do during an airstrike. Fighting rages just 25 miles away from a home in Slovyansk, a city in eastern Donetsk region, which is under regular threat of Russian airstrikes. The eight-year-old's education was first forced online by the COVID-19 pandemic, then again by Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine almost two years ago. Her mother, Iriana, says she hasn't attended school since the first grade. She used to take judo classes. She was an active child. Now I look at her and she has changed so much. She doesn't want to do anything. She doesn't have any friends. Her spirits are low now that she knows it's a long time before she can come back to school. She has changed mentally. It's hard for her. Now a third grader, Ariana says she would like to make friends, see her teacher and play outside during recess. She has never met her classmates and knows them only from their profile pictures online. The hope of returning seems a distant dream. Authorities have said classes in frontline areas like Slovyansk will remain remote unless better bomb shelters were built or until the war ends. Remote education is the only way for now. Maybe when Ukraine will win back most of all of its territory, we could consider mixed or offline studies. The possibility of studying where there is an equipped bomb shelter. Currently, we do not have this option, alas. In the northeastern region of Kharkiv, which borders Russia, Officials have begun building heavily fortified underground schools to allow children to return safely to in-person studies. Although parts of the city lie less than 20 miles from the Russian border, officials say taking lessons underground will shield pupils from the threat of supersonic Russian missiles fired at short range. Before Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, Kharkiv was Ukraine's second biggest city, with a population of more than 1.4 million, but it has since been badly scarred by fighting.
And that's the program today. But remember, our top stories are never far away. You can catch them on channelcv.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Teniola Oyetayo. Bye for now.